It's Monday. It's June 20th. And the word of the day is Struthonian. And I learned from professional word expert Susie Dent on Twitter that it means a person like an ostrich who buries their head in the sand and ignores facts and reality. Used in a sentence, the definition of Struthonian is pretty Struthonian for ignoring right? the fact that the ostrich doesn't actually do that. Nope. Sure doesn't. And also, moderate Republicans have been begging to take over that analogy for years anyway. We have a volunteer. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Heath Enright, and broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, the sane wing of Congress rejects the idea that insurrections become legal if they're stupid enough. Committed Dogecoin investors get trapped like the passenger of a flaming Tesla that locks itself from the inside. Oh, woof. And a Google AI does a better job mimicking human interaction than the guy who claims it's sentient ever managed, at least. <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight is my fellow skeptic rat, No Illusions. Noah, I hear it's like 120 degrees in South Georgia right now. You, mm -hmm. You've been throwing fireballs of plasma at James Inhofe again. What do we say? And, uh, hey, look, Andrew's list of things I'm not allowed to throw at James Inhofe is extensive, but he can't think of everything. So that's on you. That's the most common state of matter, Andrew. You should have thought of that one. In our lead story tonight. Meteorologists are predicting record-breaking heat throughout the southeastern United States for the second week in a row. In a press conference on Friday, a spokesperson from the National Weather Service explained, quote, Look, Noah found himself rooting for Liz Cheney and cheering for Bill Barr last Thursday, and all that heat that used to be in hell had to go somewhere. But yes, in an event that was covered by every news outlet with a greater reach than the Sheboygan shopper except Fox News, the January 6th committee kicked off a round of televised hearings designed to show the American public exactly how culpable Donald Trump was for the deadly failed insurrection on January 6th. And that it was just one element of his larger plan to subvert the electoral process and stage a fucking coup. Yeah. And I'd like to think most of us were thinking, yeah, we fucking know, obviously. Yeah. Now, I'm glad they're doing this, but I'd like to see a bit more of the phrase fucking duh at the official That'd be hearings. nice. Something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, as of this recording, we're three public hearings into a plan six or possibly still seven. I'm not sure. And in case it wasn't clear going in, this very much plays like an invitation to the Department of Justice to indict Trump for sedition. Uh, it, it's also designed to increase public awareness of just how criminal Trump's criminality was so that, like, say, if said indictment was to show up, people wouldn't you know, be surprised by it. And while public interest isn't quite as aroused as it might have been if the ability to jo enjoy the Pirates of the Caribbean films guilt-free was at stake, I'd like to say they've done a pretty good job so far. Uh, I, I mean, conservative pundits tried to downplay it by saying that only 20 million people watched the first hearing live, but like, like the World Series hopes for numbers like that. That's a the, big number. Yeah, the, the, just the top show on broadcast television gets half that. That's a huge fucking number. Yeah, I'd love it if that number would translate to voter turnout in the midterms being very large, too. But uh, I guess that would require like a four and a half month attention span. Yeah. So not three too optimistic. Nine, five months better than America can manage. Yeah. Now, of course, <laughs> committee co-chair Liz Cheney has taken the lead in these televised hearings, and that's led to a good bit of cognitive distance for liberals. But it seems effective. Right. Like, like Liz Cheney is able to reach out to the evil contingent of shitty Americans and say, look, I'm one of you. <laughs> right. There are few people shittier or more evil than me. I am literally the spawn of a war criminal. She is. That's true. And, and even I'm not evil enough to go along with this dumb shit. In, in a blistering opening statement, Cheney outlined the case against Trump by promising to show a sophisticated seven point plan to overthrow the elected government. Uh, and, and, well, I think that the word sophisticated is a bit generous. Uh, <laughs> the hearing leaves little doubt as to whether there was a multi-stage plan here. Seriously, give it a couple more days of these hearings. She's going to have a blueprint with Acme Dynamite involved. Right. To show us yeah, that, somehow. that Rudy Giuliani signed. Right. <laughs> so he's just dipping his pen into the shit that's melting off his forehead or whatever. So, so now, Super stable genius. <laughs> Now, I, I should admit that the first is the only hearing that I actually watched. I, I've just read summaries of the other two. Uh, but the first one was damn potent. 
They presented some video, including never-before-seen footage from police body cams and shit of the actual riot, interspersed with clips of Trump egging on the perpetrators and and, and the perpetrators using Trump as their justification. It, It showed cops getting beaten with hockey sticks. There was a cop talking about, like, slipping around on people's blood as she was trying to fight back the crowd. It it, it starkly reminded everybody watching this that it was a long fucking way from Andrew Clyde's normal tourist visitor, Paul Gosar's friendly patriots. (laughs) Uh, They they also played a clip from uh, Bill Barr's tape deposition where he described the claims of voter fraud as, quote, bullshit and, quote, idiotic. Yeah, the whole thing, it's playing like kids getting in trouble and immediately letting their lies implode and narking on each other. Just just telling mom, yeah, no, I was the one who said we should stop having the violent riot right next to Grandma's urn. I, I, said, I, said, I, said, I said exact words. I said, stop. This is irresponsible behavior. Yeah. We should stop this. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, in the second hearing, which which came on the following Monday, the committee presented a mountain of evidence that Trump knew good and goddamn well that his lies about election fraud were, in fact, lies. Uh, and, and look, I, I know that that seems like spending a day proving the wetness of water, but there are a remarkable number of people in this country that are still riding the fence on this exact issue. Uh, now, granted, any number over zero is remarkable in this context, but 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 a big part of the goal here is to drum up political support for a potential indictment, or you know, barring that, at least drum up enough political fear to keep the motherfucker from retaking office in 2025. And, and to get there, you really do need to hear firsthand testimony from the people closest to him saying that they told him in no uncertain terms that he did lose the election and there was no fraud, which is exactly what the committee spent the second hearing doing. And that included like his campaign manager, his senior advisor, his attorney general, his daughter. Uh, In fact, apparently the only person regurgitating the conspiracy theories he was hoping for was a perpetually shit-faced Rudy Giuliani. (laughs) Yeah. Apparently, the White House split up into Team Normal and Team Giuliani. Yeah. They're all from the same overall team. We know, like, your overall team had to have a faction that was saying, okay, I know this is controversial, but... We're going to do normal reality on yeah. this side of the team. And nobody on Team Normal said a word about the need for their faction to exist until everyone got caught and there was a hearing. You all helped break the urn yes. is what I'm saying. Right. Uh, now, the uh, the third hearing was far more narrowly focused on the pressure that Trump and his allies put on then-Vice President Mike Manet's sandwich, Pence, to reject electoral <laughs> votes from seven states won by Biden. Uh, This was actually at the heart of their harebrained insurrection, and it was so legally dubious that the guy who is telling it to Trump agreed with somebody else that it would get struck down 9 nothing by the Supreme Court and later asked Giuliani about maybe getting on Trump's pardon list for even promoting it. Uh, And and I should probably note that we learned earlier in the hearings that when Trump was told rioters were chanting, hang Mike Pence, his response was to give a big old thumbs up and then tweet out about how weak Mike Pence was. He might as well have tweeted out the man's noose measurements. Terrifying. We also got that same day an extremely good prank by a retired oh, federal judge who advised Mike Pence about the election certification. That guy's name is J. Michael Luddig. And OK, that's a rookie mistake right there by the committee. You don't call a witness who uses the letter J as a first name like he's mm. an F. Scott Fitzgerald character. And then we learned one of the reasons why you don't do that. This guy gave a comedically slow speech. In in fairness, he was talking about honoring the rule of law and, you know, reality. But he made time stand still. It was ridiculous. All the clocks in the room, I think they actually burst into flame and started melting like a Dali painting. It was ridiculous. Personally, I was weeping with laughter watching this happen but pretty much everyone in america turned off the tv and stopped paying attention right which is what he was trying to do right like he was a hostile sure. witness but trying to bore people to sleep before all the damning evidence came out later and in it the worked so yeah well done i mean begrudging respect for a, for a good strategy there so yeah look I, I i've long since given up on the idea that trump will ever be held accountable for his crimes as, as fucked up as it is, I literally cannot imagine a scenario where the naked attempt to overthrow the fucking government is punished in any real way, at least at the top. So in a sense, these hearings get more depressing to the same degree that they get more effective in making their case. But even if all they're doing is shouting to posterity, at least they seem to be doing a hell of a job at that. Yep. And 
now that we've got you thinking about disasters and shit, I guess we should pause for a word from this week's first sponsor, Policy Genius. You know, a lot of you have written in to ask where Eli spent the last few weeks, and the good news is that it has nothing to do with his health. His health is fine. Well, for Eli. Well, well, yeah, yeah, asterisk or whatever. But as you know, Eli is a new father and a homeowner, and with inflation and insurance rates on the rise, he's had to take some pretty drastic measures to raise a few extra dollars. Right. So he's in a foreign country doing something. It's, It's so illegal. Andrew said we're not even allowed to allude to it. On the show. We're not even allowed to give you a hint, like a clue. But he could have skipped the trip to Singapore altogether by reshopping his home and auto insurance with Policy Genius. Policy Genius customers save an average of $1,250 per year over what they were paying for home and auto insurance. Oh, what's Policy Genius? Policy Genius is all one word and the G is lowercase. Uh, what? I, they made a big deal of it in the copy. I just I thought I would mention it. Okay. But what else? Is Policy Genius. Still just one point. Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need. Head to PolicyGenius.com to get started. Policy Genius will show you price estimates for policies that fit your search. And if you like what they find, they'll get you switched over for free. Customers who bundled their home and auto insurance policies with Policy Genius saved an average of $1,250 per year over what they were paying. I don't know. I lack confidence and don't trust insurance companies. Well, that's okay because the team at Policy Genius are on hand at every step to help you make decisions with confidence and they work for you, not the insurance companies. Policy Genius doesn't add extra fees and they don't sell your info to third parties. And that's why they've earned thousands of five-star reviews across Google and Trustpilot. Well, that sounds great. How do I sign up? Head to PolicyGenius.com to get your free home insurance quote and see how much you could save. So... Why didn't you just tell Eli about Policy Genius? Oh, because then he wouldn't have had to. Okay, well, now I'm going to have to bleep stuff. Oh, sorry. Maybe I'll keep it. We'll see what Policy Genius says. (laughs) And we're back. Next up in headlines in Doge Eat Doge News. (laughs) Elon Musk got sued for... $258 $258 billion last week really? for allegedly operating a pyramid scheme in support of the dog-themed cryptocurrency Dogecoin. The complaint was filed in New York by cryptocurrency investor Keith Johnson, who claims that Musk and his companies Tesla and SpaceX are guilty of racketeering for artificially driving up the price of a thing that has no intrinsic value and then letting that price experience a huge drop in recent months. Now, okay, it sounds like he just described cryptocurrency Mm -hmm. in general, the thing he chose to invest in, so I don't have a lot of sympathy, but I also really don't like Elon Musk. So maybe it's a lose-lose for all the shitty people involved, which is also known as a win-win. We'll We'll see how the lawsuit pans out. Okay, but, but but like artificially driving up the price of a thing that has no intrinsic value and then letting that price experience a huge drop in recent months could also describe Tesla stock, right? <laughs> it could. Yeah, and Elon Musk's net worth. Yeah. So <laughs> here's a quick background on Dogecoin for anyone who's not familiar. It started in 2013 as very literally a joke to make fun of cryptocurrency speculation. Yep. The creators used the Shiba Inu dog from the Doge meme as the logo. The whole thing was a joke, and it became known as the first meme coin. But then a bunch of ironic hipster crypto bros on Reddit decided to treat it like a real investment, and it turned into one of the top 10 cryptocurrencies in the world. One of its main applications was using the coin to send tips to content creators on platforms like Twitch using a transaction service called Doge tip bot. But then in 2017, that service went bankrupt and a whole bunch of people lost all their tips that were being held in the Doge tip bot system when it got taken down Woof. because of the bankruptcy. Spoiler, that general thing can happen with any cryptocurrency service or just with the value of any crypto coin. For example, Dogecoin, <laughs> which is down from a high of 74 cents to about five cents over the last year. Well, which, to be clear, is still a hell of a price to get for a currency that nobody takes for anything and doesn't exist, right? (laughs) Right. Step back from it a bit. Still a seller's market in that sense. Go ahead. You're getting five cents for that shit. So the allegation about price manipulation 
includes a series of tweets by Musk about Dogecoin from late 2020 and early 2021 that were immediately followed by large jumps in the price, sometimes as much as 40% within hours. And in April of 2021, he tweeted an image of the Miro painting, Dog Barking at the Moon, with the caption, Doge Barking at the Moon. And when he did that, the price of the coin rose by more than 100% almost immediately. Woof. And then in May, he went on SNL and did a sketch as a financial expert who called Dogecoin a hustle. And <laughs> he miscalculated this. When he did that, people took investing advice from a sketch character. They really did. <laughs> and it lost about a third of its value before the show was over, before <laughs> SNL ended. That's so dumb. Yeah. So he obviously, you know, misunderestimated the stupidity of his followers. So... The next day, SpaceX announced a rideshare mission to the moon completely funded by Dogecoin, <laughs> whatever the fuck that means. But that didn't really help because, you know, that's meaningless. Right. You would need to, you know, use that Dogecoin to get dollars and then buy things <laughs> with dollars. And Dogecoin has been tanking pretty much ever since. Okay, I'm I'm sure that this lawsuit has no merit, but I also want to sue Elon Musk for how stupid his fanboys are. Okay, if we're, <laughs> if we're doing that, let's just fucking do it. Class action lawsuit by everyone else. Let's have that for sure. So, according to the lawsuit, quote, Elon Musk, Tesla, and SpaceX, the defendants, were aware since 2019 that Dogecoin had no value, yet promoted Dogecoin to profit from its trading. Musk used his pedestal as the world's richest man to operate and manipulate the Dogecoin pyramid scheme for profit, exposure, and amusement, end quote. And yes, it seems like he absolutely yep. did all of that. But unlike a currency that's backed by, for example, the entire existence of a very large nation, crypto has pretty much no rules. So Elon Musk was able to do all that stuff, and it was technically legal. So the lawsuit is trying to claim that even without rules about standard investment vehicles being applicable, Musk violated some New York laws about pyramid schemes, racketeering, and illegal gambling. The lawsuit wants this to be declared illegal gambling. And the plaintiff, on behalf of everyone who bought Dogecoin recently, is seeking the $86 billion in lost value since a year ago, but also triple that, <laughs> because fuck you, I guess. Now, I'm sure there's... Something about triple in the law that's got to be based on something. But it sounds like he just said, yeah, and fucking triple it. I don't know. Three, I want three of those. So that's a total of, again, $258 billion in the complaint. And uh, just for the record, Musk is worth about $200 billion. So maybe negative 58. Yeah, we'll find just, out. Just dated this episode. So the, the one thing <laughs> of genuine value, I think, that's come from cryptocurrency so far is watching the advocates of an unregulated market learn why we put those regulations there in the first place <laughs> in the most painful way possible. Right? Yeah, they're not going to learn. But yeah, well, in, yeah, that's, in that's theory, fair. that information is there. Fair. So the first big takeaway here, we should have laws about cryptocurrency yeah. like we have about all the other stuff. I'm not sure what kind of libertarian nonsense is preventing that, but if millions of people are spending billions of dollars to invest in something, uh, maybe some rules. We have rules about all the other ones where, where we do that kind of thing. But more importantly, here's the other big takeaway. I would like to punch Elon Musk in the face. It's very mm. important to me. If punchable face was in the dictionary, the whole entry, it's just the headshot of Elon Musk. Yeah. I want to punch it so bad. But... I'm not going to do that. You shouldn't punch him either. But you should really want to punch him. If you don't really want to punch him in the face, I'm judging you. Why don't you want to punch him in the face? Just look at him. Look at that Look face. at his face. It's dying for you. And it, yeah. And in hallucination news tonight. <laughs> Google software engineer Blake Lemoyne was placed on administrative leave after claiming that the company's chatbot generator has gained sentience. <laughs> and that's led to an interesting philosophical question. Namely, 
Why the fuck are we listening to a guy who goes around looking like Ben Franklin cosplaying <laughs> Willy Wonka and cites his religious <laughs> beliefs as a mystic Christian priest to justify claims what? that every credible expert is laughing at? Those are his fucking words. That's, it's mystic his term. A Christian myst- priest. Yes. priest. That's his own self-description. Yes. Like, seriously, okay. why the fuck is this news? The actual story here is mentally unstable guy put on leave so he doesn't hurt self. But the media is running with it as though it's time to turn to John fucking Connor to organize our defenses. <laughs> okay, yeah, when a guy with a top hat and a cane in 2022 mm-hmm. says, we invented Skynet, or anything else he says, <laughs> no matter what that person says, the correct response is, nope, you have a top hat and a cane. Don't don't talk to me like you don't have a top hat and a cane right now. Yes. Get out of here. Yes, unless you're asking me what animal I want that balloon to be shaped like. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> so, Are you selling peanuts? No? Great. <laughs> so, to be clear, I, I, I'm not labeling the guy mentally unstable flippantly here. Uh, when asked about Google's response to his claim, Lemoyne himself said, quote, They have repeatedly questioned my sanity. They said, have you been checked out by a psychiatrist recently? End quote. Uh, and then he admitted that in the months before he was forced to take leave the company had repeatedly suggested he take mental health leave and 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 his claim that this program is sentient is about as outlandish as claiming that your phone can feel pain it's a fucking chat bot generator <laughs> it's it's programmed to parse sentences on the internet and then craft new ones that sound like shit alive people would say like so so it spontaneously becoming conscious is about as likely as a spreadsheet program spontaneously becoming a first person shooter Right, except that first-person shooters are a thing that exists. This is not how anything works. <laughs> yeah, the chatbot clearly flirted with him in his head, and he was like, strippers do like me. It's alive. It's alive. <laughs> And look, yes, the question of where an artificial intelligence crosses the line to a sentient being is a fascinating question with profound moral implications, but it's not a fucking new one. Alan Turing was talking about this shit when computers were still using vacuum tubes. Moral philosophers have been debating this shit for over 70 years. And the question is so important that Google has ethicists on staff whose entire job is to worry about this shit. Do they wear top hats and canes? No, no, probably not. And they're not worried about this shit. Right, not this one. Like when Lemoyne first started telling Google that they needed to get the program's consent to run experiments on it, they had a group of engineers and ethicists look into the claim and they said, Are you fucking serious, man? The guy was wearing a <laughs> top hat and carrying a cane. <laughs> okay, but while we're doing evaluations, I'd also like to see how Blake Lemoyne does on a Turing test. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, how do we know he's not part of no, the that's AI? A, that's is a, what I'm saying. Good. Good point. And sure, I I guess there could be a scenario where a big tech company creates an AI and whitewashes the investigation into it so they don't have to worry about, like, Electro-PETA protesting on its behalf or whatever. (laughs) PETA flop? I don't know. But but that's super duper not what happened here. Thank you. Even the highly edited, highly selective dialogues that Lemoyne has shared don't show any real evidence that the program in question is anything other than a good chatbot. That's maybe flirty by accident yeah. sometimes, probably. And yeah. I, look, I think we can all agree that if and when science crosses the hurdle to truly artificial consciousness, we're not going to hear about it from a man who unironically owns a top hat. <laughs> okay? That's like the one thing I feel like the whole goddamn world can agree on at this point. And speaking of alternatives that Blake Lemoyne might have considered before going public with this, it's time for a word from this week's other sponsor, BetterHelp. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, podcast listener. Life can be overwhelming, and many people are burned out without even knowing it. Symptoms can include lack of motivation, feeling helpless or trapped, detachment, fatigue, and more. Yeah, sometimes it's yelling at impertinent road signs. Yeah, yeah. Or day drinking alone at your sink out of a cereal bowl. Whoa. It happens. Was it, a, was it a clean cereal bowl? No, it was not. Yikes. And it's not just about burnout from work. Those symptoms can stem from any of life's responsibilities. Well, that's why BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. Talking to someone can help you figure out what's causing the stress in your life. Oh, what's BetterHelp? I, well, I, I already explained it. It's, it's online therapy. Got it. Yeah, no, 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 I, I got it. Just racking up the points. Yeah, no, that's the important it. thing right now. Okay, so what's better help more specifically? Still only one point. 
Yeah, it's a treaty of Montclair. Yeah, yep. fine. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. And Skeptocrat listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. That's BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. All right, that sounds good, but... Here's the thing. I don't see how they're going to help with the fact that the Fed is a Ponzi scheme and they're intentionally creating a recession right now by raising the federal funds rate and pretending that monetary policy is a real thing. I, I, don't, know, I don't know if it's going to help with that. I'll just give you a second to hear it. Yeah. OK. This is a crazy burnout rant. Yeah, I'll check out BetterHelp. Great. So so why is the day drinking over the sink? That's where the dirty bowls are. Oh, OK. And we're back. Next up in headlines, 71-year-old Nancy Crampton Brophy <laughs> of Portland, Oregon, was sentenced to life in prison last week after being found guilty of shooting and killing her husband, Daniel Brophy, with a 9mm Glock pistol in 2018. And this would just be another typical, you know, everyday run-of-the-mill gun murder in America, actually with a refreshingly small number of victims than normal, if not for one important detail. Nancy Crampton Brophy is a romance author who wrote a blog in 2011 called How to Murder Your Husband. So, yeah, it was an awkward seven years at the end of the marriage. I would yeah. Imagine. Okay, so step one, don't presage it with a blog post. Wait, 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 <laughs> come on. That wasn't in the blog. Amazing. Should have been. So here's the list of possible motives for murder from Nancy's blog about the crime she was very clearly learning about for at least seven years, and see if you can spot any clues along the way. Quote, Motive one, financial. Divorce is expensive, and do you really want to split your possessions? She actually tried to get the insurance money right after the death, over a million dollars. Motive two, lying. He's a cheating bastard. This is a crime of passion. In anger, you bash his head in or stab him with a kitchen knife. The husband was a chef, by the way. Motive three, fell in love with someone else. Let's say your church frowns on divorce. You need to be a widow so you won't fall out of favor with your religion. Yikes. Motive four, abuser. This one is tough. Anyone can claim abuse. What is abuse? Okay, that's a weird skeptical tone there. Yeah, right, what? Creepy. Motive five, it's your profession. Now we're talking. You already possess both skill and knowledge. You have the moral ambiguity necessary to carry it off, end quote. Carry it out. But, but like, <laughs> come on, lady, you're a writer, you said? Okay, so that last one isn't a motive, right? Like, <laughs> it's, it's just a different thing. Like, does she think that assassins just have a murder quota? There were, of course, yeah. not anybody specific. You just have to kill a certain number of, sorry, Han, I have four more murders to hit by the 15th. I'm running way behind you right here, so... What? I am artificially sentient and programmed to murder by Google. <laughs> I must murder. It's my profession. Yeah, that was weird. And another important part of Nancy's blog slash murder manifesto was the section about exactly how to do the murder called Options to Consider. Quote, guns, loud, messy, require some skill. Knives, really personal and close up, blood everywhere, ew. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to kill someone in a gross way. Yeah, <laughs> Right, yeah. Garrote, how much upper body strength does it take to strangle a person? Question mark, end quote. How much upper body strength does it take to strangle a person was all she wrote there. And she kept asking questions like that as if she was getting answers from people. She also mentioned hiring a hitman and asked, do you know a hitman? <laughs> Question mark. And she closed out the section by asking about her very hypothetical fictional character. She wrote, quote, what if the killing didn't produce the right results? Would they do it again? Could they do it again? What if they liked it? Whoa, there's an idea for a new story. And then in real life, we know now, she started buying components to make a homemade gun while at the same time drafting a story about a character buying components to make a homemade <laughs> gun Christ. murder their spouse. And that was actually used by the defense team at the trial 
to explain why she bought components to make a homemade gun. Jesus. Well, so, so I, of course, I, I immediately start thinking about if my mom was doing like. So, so I'm, I'm imagining her with like a. She's sitting there at the table with a padlock, some chicken broth, and a cask. She's going, okay, wait, wait, which one do you make the trigger out of? I don't get it. But then actually murdered somebody. Yeah, right. So <laughs> one other detail from the trial that I found a little suspect. According to the person who found the dead body, Daniel Brophy's face had the expression of being, quote, utterly heartbroken. So, okay, first of all, I didn't think your face would actually freeze in the emotional <laughs> face acting pose that you were doing at the exact moment of death. Apparently that is a thing. I didn't know that. Oh, really? But I'm suspicious because that's the wrong face. I feel like it's the wrong face. I feel like if I spent the last seven years making jokes with my wife about how she wrote a book about how to kill me, and then she pulls out a gun and she's about to kill me, my face is going to read more like, okay, no, that's pretty funny. That's a solid bit. <laughs> like, no, good. You're committing to the bit. I get it. I get it. But no, utter heartbroken is apparently what he did. Either way, she's going to write some really good stuff in jail. It's all about the art. You got to yeah. commit to the art. There you go. And in SETI or not, here we come news tonight. <laughs> I already did a story about the indictment that the proof of criminal conspiracy won't garner and the consciousness a Google chatbot didn't achieve. So I guess I should also do a story about the alien signal that Chinese astronomers didn't detect. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah, despite a few sensationalist headlines to the contrary, Chinese astronomers remain tied with all the other Earthlings in terms of detected signals from advanced <laughs> alien intelligences at zero. Uh, this despite an announcement from scientists in the state-run Science and Technology Daily that led skeptics to express concern and anybody who's read the three-body problem to suggest maybe we give a different country first crack at the response. <laughs> okay, if we're worried about an attack by aliens, maybe just send back some video of the January 6th hearings and definitely oh, start with J. Michael Ludding. Yeah. Don't turn that ship right the fuck around. Just be like, we wait until they blow themselves up, right? And then we just go back and steal ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> or they'll just fall into extended hibernation and, and, and never come out. So either way, we're good. <laughs> so yeah, this, this news comes to us from the largest radio telescope in the world, which is located in the Guizhou province in central China. And in keeping with astronomers' inexplicable passion for using shitty acronyms to name huge telescopes, it's called the FAST telescope for 500 right. meter aperture spherical radio telescope. That's not... It's not really capturing. No, it's look. That's that's bad enough for the hyper hyphenation and ignoring one of the worst. But also, yeah, the the fucking thing's a paraboloid, right? Like think okay. think Arecibo so. Observatory, only two hundred meters bigger in diameter and not all crushed to fucking useless. So I, I have no idea what the spherical is even referring to there. It's fucking radio telescope. They just wanted an S in there. I get well because otherwise they would have, they'd have to call it the fart, right? <laughs> That's true. Or okay. or if they can't handle that, that, they could maybe use P for parabolic, call it the FAPT. I, I just say, regardless of what you call it, uh, it did not eavesdrop on E.T.'s phone call. Okay. I got to say, though, credit where credit's due. There was a similar project that ran from 2014 to 2019 using the Parkes radio telescope called Survey for Pulsars and Extragalactic Radio Bursts, or Superb. Nice. And that one... Is closer. It's pretty good. Pretty good. I also like the bright infrared galaxy <laughs> all sky survey called Big Ass. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that's Couple the thing is that we we know that they can do good acronyms, but when it comes to telescopes, they just don't. You guys have so many more vocabulary words Come than on. most people. Right. It's so much easier to do acronyms. Right. Just d up. So the initial report, which was retracted by the paper less than 24 hours after it was posted online, actually referred to a candidate signal that was deemed too narrow for a natural occurrence. So when radio signals have natural origins, they tend to move around on the band a bit. But this one was just kind of sitting at 140.607 megahertz. Of course, there are options between alien technology and natural origin. Oh, oh, I know one. Because yeah, no, because like as dumb as we are, humans still qualify as intelligent beings, and we make shit. <laughs> There you go. And and while the source of the signal hasn't been exactly pinned down yet, there's no reason to think it's anything other than radio interference. According to Zhang Tongjai, the chief scientist of the China ET Civilization Research Group, quote, the possibility that the suspicious signal is some kind of radio interference is very high and it needs to be further confirmed or ruled out, adding, quote, this may be a long process, end quote. Just want to be clear on this. They detected a signal that was too human-like 
And they were like, it's got to be aliens. Yes, right, right. right. What the fuck? Yeah, the, the, the only noteworthy thing about this story is that it ever slipped out to begin with. Apparently, this is something that happens constantly when you're looking for extraterrestrial signals. Uh, I, I've seen SETI's 40-year quest for signs of alien life described as a multi-decadal game of false signal whack-a-mole. And when SETI uh, <laughs> scientists initially saw these reports from the Chinese discovery, they immediately said, well, yeah, man, that's like a fucking satellite or something. <laughs> and then the Chinese uh, government's news agency went, oh, man, and then they backed away in a, in a hurry. Okay, I'm sure these facilities are run by real scientists in China here, but one of the false alarms that we had eight years ago turned out to be scientists microwaving their lunch in the break room. Yeah, uh-huh. And they didn't get that for a while. So a while. <laughs> uh, this was aliens or maybe a Hot Pockets ready. Let's, <laughs> let's, maybe, guys, check for the Hot Pocket Rule out first. the Hot That's Pocket, That's step one. Yeah. Now, of course, all that being said, I want to make it clear that I wholeheartedly support this ongoing effort, even if the news is always disappointing. It's the kind of thing that only needs to hit once uh, and shitty name or no fast is a fucking engineering marvel that's better equipped to find traces of alien life than anything else we've ever built with the possible exception of the james webb space telescope so let me clarify that I- i'm i'm shitting on the science media not the science <laughs> okay fair enough and finally tonight in bitter pillow to swallow news oh i've missed this kind of news <laughs> we have some amazing news walmart decided to remove the my pillow brand from their stores last week And Mike Lindell is having a delightful meltdown in response. He's complaining that they're pulling his product because of politics, which is another example of cancel culture. And, um, yes, yes, it is. It's exactly that. It's a beautiful, sparkling consequence of cancel culture gone exactly the right amount of far. (laughs) Actually, if anything, it's not quite far enough because Walmart is still going to be selling my pillow on their website for a while, just not in the physical stores. Now, I'm guessing they're just doing that to get rid of their backstock of shitty trader themed pillows, but still, we need more canceling like this. It's going great. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, you can call it cancel culture if you want, Mike, but the term the rest of us use is people not wanting your shit. <laughs> exactly. Right, your your pillows are failing for the same reason as your only fans, bro. <laughs> I would happily pay for his OnlyFans if I didn't have to buy one of his pillows. So, in response to the beautiful canceling, Lindell went on a tour of the Huffy Alt-Right Morning shows last week and sputtered sentence fragments into the camera for the last few days. That includes an appearance on Steve Bannon's podcast, during which Lindell told the story of the video call with Walmart about the cancellation. The Walmart executive he was talking to told him that the my pillow line had fallen below a rating of four no okay i'm sure that's some kind of useful metric they have at walmart but i love how it sounds because it sounds like the walmart guy was just making shit up on the spot being like yeah so ah, it's a, you got a fucking four man it's out of my hands it's a four. Oh, what's a what's a four that's um it's a we have a whole it's shitty on our it's bad. scale it's... <laughs> it four is shitty <laughs> Yeah, you need to be a five to be considered meh, and, you know, your pillows are decidedly not the level of meh that we demand here at our amazing Walmart stores. And that's when Lindell started yelling about cancel culture and threatened that Walmart executive with getting a whole bunch of attention on the news for the retail chain. Yeah, no, I'm sure Walmart is very concerned. Dude, you can't keep a documentary up on YouTube, okay? <laughs> Your commercials come on at 3 a.m. on Fox News 8 and Eric Metaxas <laughs> counterfeit SNL, which airs at 3 a.m. on Fox News 8. I, th- I think Walmart is going to be okay, bro. Yeah. So here's my favorite part of the story. And keep in mind, this is Mike Lindell telling the story, and it's my favorite part. By his own account, he tried to argue back like during a breakup call he was getting broken up with me tried to argue back and no like, it is me it is do like me. an exit interview yeah <laughs> so he told the walmart exec you do realize that bots and trolls attack all the time <laughs> all the so, way from china yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah he thinks like hugo chavez wrote a computer program <laughs> Nine years after dying that would spam the Walmart website with bad reviews for my pillow. But even if all of that was literally true, Walmart would just be like, 
yeah, okay, maybe maybe that's true, but you got a fucking four, man. Yeah. <laughs> People aren't buying your pillows, and that's our whole thing is selling stuff. So the alt-right libertarian Mike Lindell spent the week whining to other alt-right libertarians like fucking Steve Bannon that he got canceled by supply and demand. Yeah. Which is so fun to watch. Yeah, how dare the free market freely market? <laughs> and, yeah, he, he got canceled by the invisible hand. It's awesome. And here's the part of the conversation I'm guessing Mike Lindell left out of the story. At some point, the Walmart guy must have been like, yeah, so, okay, Mike, you know, um, demand? <laughs> do, you, do you know demand? <laughs> We have less than before demand for your thing because of, I don't know, well, uh, that time you tried to help overthrow American democracy, mm -hmm. that's one. That, oh, and because your net worth might actually be like negative $1.3 billion, depending <laughs> on a lawsuit. Uh, and because you're a CEO who can't say a subject and a predicate with a period at the end <laughs> ever, ever, ever in your life. And that's when Lindell slammed his computer shut by his own account and then probably got even angrier because you know that's not the cathartic act you want it to be like hanging up an old timey phone just closing a laptop not the same bottom line when the voice of social justice in the argument you're having is walmart the corporation <laughs> yes! against you they're the cancel culture people <sighs> if that's the case it's time to shut the fuck up and just Slowly die as your sarlacc of a mustache eats you alive. Oh, Just do it, man. God. Every time I see that thing, Let I half happen. expect a Tuscan Raider to be riding it. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of Star Wars references at the end here. <laughs> Go, I don't know, sleep in a tauntaun or something. And on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. Thanks to Mike Lindell. That was fun. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and send us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like all the generous new donors who will have their genitals complimented profusely next time around. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Skating Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed. Available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all those other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slonick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He is the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide, or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. I came really close to saying the diatribe there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right on. Okay, I'm sure I could have bitched it about something on the fly. I could have yelled yeah. at God, God damn fucking. Have you seen these commercials now for this auto? Which how many times could I save 20%? You would think I could just keep calling <laughs> them over and over again. And eventually it would approach zero. The Fed is curbing inflation. You have to do this. It's one of their two <laughs> things. It's, the, it's like the whole justification for having them there. <laughs> Literally, they do two things. This is one. <laughs> Fuck. I can't believe Fox didn't cover it. Like, they, they need to be illegal now. Like, if you don't cover that, you're not news. You're No, you're not. We already well, they've that, already. Yeah, not. they've already, like, it's been adjudicated not news in a court of law, I do believe. <laughs> That's true. In fairness, they, they were covering the Colbert insurrection by seven producers. Yeah, so, no. That's well, and, 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 and look, if you've got two insurrections and one of them has a dog puppet, you go with the one with the, It's just, <laughs> it's like if it bleeds, it leads. It's just that's one yeah, of the rules right, yeah. of the news. <laughs> the preceding podcast is a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, copyright 2022, all rights reserved.